see what's going on. Welcome to Hope United Church of Christ in Moline, Illinois. We are so glad you have joined us for worship this morning. It is good to be back after a week off. My family and I are grateful for the time away. Thank you to the good Reverend Carol Holtz Martin for uh, covering our worship last week, for offering the word, and um, with all the beauty with which you do that. Thank you, Carol, and thank you, Lisa and Ben, for holding down the fort also here um, in church last Sunday while we were gone. Please make sure you join us for our Zoom coffee hour following worship today at 11 o'clock. Uh, the link is on our Facebook page. Come on uh, anytime between 11 and 12. Uh, someone's going to be on. You can talk and chat and catch up. So really wonderful happy announcement this morning. If you got your newsletter, you may have already read it, but just to make this proclamation uh, clear, uh, the Hope United Church of Christ in Moline, Illinois is an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. Uh, <laughs> two years in the making, uh, this congregation, our friends and family, the community of this church, members and friends, have lovingly and in a sacred fashion um, moved through the open and affirming process. We took a break last summer, but we have moved through it uh, together under the stewardship of our ONA committee, uh, which was uh, con consists of, I should say, Sue Gurchin, Kathy Hobson, Bob Talich, Walt, uh, Jan Caridad, and Becky Newton. Thank you for your guidance in this. We had to take our vote uh, via the mail. Uh, thank you, U.S. Postal Service, for making that possible. But we had 93 yes votes and six no votes. So we will celebrate this wonderful milestone when we are together in person and able to do so. But for now, we rejoice and we celebrate virtually and we live out this open and affirming covenant in new ways. Um, in fact, let me read that covenant to you real quick. Um, here is our open and affirming covenant that was approved uh, in this congregation. 
uh, Hope United Church of Christ invites and welcomes into our faith community persons of every ability, age, race, nationality, economic and social status, faith background, marital standing, family structure, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. We commit ourselves to the ongoing work of being an open and affirming and ONA congregation, one that lives out the belief that God is still speaking. With God's grace, we journey together in Christian faith. May it be so. Thank you again for your confidence, uh, for the work of our committee, and for listening to how God is speaking within your heart. Uh, we have a quiet week um, ahead. We have our lectionary Bible study uh, on Tuesday, which you can log in on Zoom. And we'll also have, uh, as long as we don't get too large, we'll also be holding that in person too. So if you don't have access to Zoom and you'd like to join us in the sanctuary, we'll be all spread out for a hybrid Zoom um, lectionary in-person Bible study. And then, of course, the quiet table contemplative service Thursday night. So we are glad you are here. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Hope United Church of Christ. And as we are here today, thank you, Facebook. Thank you to the technology gurus who make it possible. It's our special time together to shut out the noise of the world, to just listen to how God is speaking to you in this time together, uh, a time we devote to the holy. So breathe. Just breathe. Find that center. Find our core. Listen to the one who gives us strength, one who loves us always, each of us, a precious child of God. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And come, let us worship. Good morning. Please join with me in the call to worship. Come with joy and gladness to praise and honor God. Come to the refreshing waters that God provides. Give ear, all people, to the law of God. Give thanks for all the guidance God gives us. Come, all who are weary in carrying heavy burdens. Come, for Christ has promised rest. The gentle spirit of Christ invites us. We have come to find rest for our souls. Our opening hymn is Shall We Gather Together at the River.
let us continue our worship together as we invite God into our midst with our prayer of invocation. We come together, gracious God, because we have heard your invitation. We sense that you alone know the burdens we carry. You understand our weariness. Sometimes our journey seems long and without respite. We long for the refreshment you provide as we come to worship you. The anticipation of this hour of rest and nourishment fills us with renewed joy and gladness. We thank you, God, that your revelation comes to us, not because we are worthy, but because we are open to your word. Open our hearts to receive all you offer. Amen. As we pray that God opens our hearts, we must acknowledge on that journey, we must acknowledge the ways we have knowingly and unknowingly separated ourselves from God's will for us, from God's good intention with our creation. We've each done it. Each day there's something we wish we could go back and say a different way or behave in a different way or think something different um, in our words, our actions, our deeds. God gives us this opportunity. God gives us the grace. God grants us the mercy of repentance. So let us take a moment, just first in silence, and then together to offer our prayer of confession. Please join me in our prayer of confession. God, we do not understand our own actions. We turn away from the good we intend on doing. Yet we find wisdom in your law. We delight in the idea of mutual caring and celebrating life together, but we get bogged down in our own concerns. We are too busy to seek community and too preoccupied to ponder your will for us. We go our own way, cutting ourselves off from you and one another. Oh God, help us to put away this sin. Amen. Those are hard words to say out loud, sometimes even harder to say in the quiet of our hearts. But know this, be assured of this, as I stand before the cross that assures us of this, of God's love, God's mercy, God's unending hope for us, that we are forgiven. We are created in the image of God and we are blessed with the capacity to reflect God's will in our daily lives. God cares for us and invests us with responsibility. Thus, God honors us with the high expectations and confidence in our willingness to seek out life's best for all people, all of God's creation. We are loved, we are forgiven, and our baptism is renewed. Thanks be to God. Let us offer one another that peace that Christ has given us and the hope, the love that we see reflected in the cross. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Peace be with you. And as you wish each other peace uh, online as well. You know, that line in the prayer of invocation, I, I wanted to read that again. The anticipation of this hour of rest and nourishment fills us with renewed joy and gladness. We long for the refreshment you provide as we come to worship you. you know, this prayer was written before we had to pause in person worship. That prayer was written with the vision of community of people gathered in person in these sanctuary walls and it feels different and yet we know we are gathered together as God's people living 
what we always say, the church is not about the building, but sometimes it's a little bit of a punch in the gut <laughs> to uh, remember that. But we are a people of hope. We are a people that believe in God's hand in all of this and faith leading us forward with confidence. With those words I say, may the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, you will find rest for your soul. These words that we will hear in our gospel in just a few minutes, Lord, are from you. They are your words spoken by your son, Jesus the Christ. To a people who were weary, a people who were weary then, and a people who are weary now. And we are weary, Lord. Isolation, economic fears, boredom, health fears, political and social divisions, anger, environmental fears, and learning and understanding and being held accountable in discussions around racial injustice and equality. How can we believe these words of your son, these words that are from you, God? And so we pray. We pray, God, that you give us the courage to trust this profound and merciful invitation. We pray that we will gather at the river. We pray, Lord, that you will let us seek out your goodness and find the peace and rest that we long for, that we are looking for, that we so deeply need. We pray that you embolden us to share your yoke so that we may find you and your goodness in our damaged world. Because as we share our burdens, we are able to lift our eyes, stand up straighter, look up and see and know your grace and your healing love, God. Because it is your grace and your healing that empower us to share your yoke with others. Let the healing begin, O holy and loving God. And let it begin within each of us, each one of us, so that we may bring your healing, love, and mercy to all your creation. We ask your blessings and healing touch be felt and known to Nancy as she navigates this new and frightening health challenge in her life. Keep her rested, Lord, because it is in this rest that her body will heal. Bless and strengthen her family as they support and care for her and love her. Her daughter and her grandchildren and beloved sisters need your healing hand upon them as well. We pray today again for all those who continue to struggle with this pandemic, all essential workers, all those who are sick, those who have died, and those who have lost loved ones to this virus. And we pray also today for those who resist what we know helps alleviate this, this pandemic. Let us grow in the love that opens our eyes to empathy and understanding, that enables us to think about the needs and the concerns of others. So that our own behaviors can change to help them live longer and healthier lives. We pray that you hear our prayers this morning that we lift to you and to each other as we type them in so that our community of faith 
can pray for each other. Holy God, your mercy is great. And you made it known, your mercy and your love. You made all this known through Jesus, who lives within us and teaches us your love. Let us pray together the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Hebrew scripture lesson today comes from Genesis, verses, chapter 24, verses 34 to 38, 42 to 49, and 58 to 67. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master, and he has become wealthy. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female slaves, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife from my son and the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live. But you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way that I am going. I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished, finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from the shoulder and said, drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered my camels. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethlehem. Nahor's son, whom Micah has borne to me. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshiped to the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you will deal loyally and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so that I may turn either to the right hand or to the left. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will. So they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse along with Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of myriads. May your offspring gain possession of the gates of their foes. Then Rebekah and her maids rose up, mounted the camels, and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had come from Beer Lahagrai and was settled in Negev. Isaac went out in the evening to walk in the field, and looking up he saw camels coming. And Rebekah looked up, and when she saw Isaac, she slipped quickly from her camel and said to the servant, Who is the man over there? 
walking in the field to meet us. The servant said, it is my master. She took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The New Testament today comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19 and verses 25 to 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all that are weary and all that are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I forgot to mention at the start of worship, today is Communion Sunday. We will be celebrating the Sacrament of Holy Communion in all of our distinct locations together this morning. So please make sure you have your elements that represent for you the bread and the cup. Look forward to that. <clears throat> Each day brings new headlines that I would like to avoid listening to or reading. And I'm not going to list them all right now. You know them as well as I do. But an ongoing debate that has renewed attention right now is about the images we've created, the images of Jesus that we have created. If you think about Jesus right now, what image pops into your head? I would venture to say that for many of us, myself included, we're most familiar with the image of Jesus painted by the American artist Warner Salman that portrays Jesus as a fair-skinned, blonde-haired young man with a very serene expression. That painting has been re reproduced more than half a billion times across the world. And of course, who can forget Jesus Christ Superstar where we had serious hippie Jesus, or Godspell, my favorite, with the clowny, funny hippie Jesus. We're particular about Jesus. We all have an image of him implanted within us. Maybe it's influenced by our old Bible storybooks or a film, which is the nexus of the debate about his appearance. Why aren't more accurate depictions of Jesus more common? But no matter how we imagine he looked, we are in agreement about his personality. We're all pretty sure he was kind and patient, funny, welcoming, and understanding. After all, Jesus was the incarnation of our loving and merciful God. So of course, Jesus would embody all these characteristics. He is patient and kind because God is patient and kind, correct? This is how we want Jesus to be. This is how we need Jesus to be. Matthew's gospel this morning portrays Jesus in a different kind of mood. 
Jesus sounds a little less patient as he calls out the behavior of this crowd. Jesus actually sounds frustrated and sarcastic. I kind of like this Jesus. I think I can relate to him a little bit more. As he is addressing this crowd, he's fully aware there are people in it who completely doubt him, who speak badly about him, and who did the same about John, John the Baptist. Now, both Jesus and John have been rejected by their people, so Jesus is calling attention to what they are doing. These are the same people who have been told to wait, wait for the Messiah. The Messiah is coming, wait. However, when they met John, a prophet who spoke of this coming Messiah, of the Savior, they rejected him because he made them uncomfortable with his appearance, with his behavior, with his message. And yes, John the Baptist, we all know we consider him a little out there, but he was authentic, he was honest, and very candid about preparing the way for the one who was to come. John's prophetic work called for repentance, and his fervor and message ultimately led to his imprisonment and his execution. Jesus reminds everyone gathered that some of them rejected John in a way that underscored that they didn't understand or they didn't want to understand John and his prophetic message. And not only did they reject John, Jesus points out they're rejecting him as well. He reminds them that they said John was too austere, too rigid, too harsh. Then they experience Jesus in his ministry, and then they decide Jesus is too nice, that Jesus' practice of extravagant welcome and radical hospitality was just too much for them. They thought there must be something wrong with him, or why else would he be seen with all these outcasts, all these rejects in their communities? Why would he advocate helping all these people that they had been taught were untouchable or offensive in some way? Jesus' message of love could only be explained by the fact there must be something wrong with him. Jesus presents his audience with the reality of their actions. They claim they want to be saved. They claim to live as people of God. But when given the opportunities to really live that way, to do so, they reject God because they don't like John's message of repentance and they balk at Jesus' message of grace. They want suitable discipleship, a call that they're comfortable with. Work is fine, <clears throat> but really, really changing their lives or really changing their hearts, <clears throat> moving beyond the law into a new way of understanding <clears throat> and living out a new covenant with God? No, thank you. The verses that are omitted from today's reading show that Jesus is calling out the behavior of specific towns where he taught and healed. He tells them that their continued denial of the good news he brings will lead to their destruction. After Jesus finishes speaking about the cities that have failed to recognize his ministry, he changes his tone into the tone that we're accustomed to hearing from kind, sweet, patient Jesus. His harshness is gone and the broad, sweeping judgment is over. And he begins to pray. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. He thanks God for giving people the understanding of God's way. And Jesus identifies these people as infants. The infants in our passage represent all those in society with the least power, the ordinary people, not the Pharisees, the high priests, the rich or the powerful. No, Jesus is speaking about those who are just scraping by, 
the people who are asking the heartfelt questions about God, the people who are tired of the daily grind. These are the folks Jesus identifies as infants. Jesus understands God better than anyone, but in this prayer, he tenderly invites anyone who is willing to listen and learn to join him so they can be transformed and know God's love also. Jesus understands this is not an easy commitment to make. It was not easy then, and it is not easy now. We have so many things pulling us away from God and God's ways. How are we supposed to trust Jesus and his call into discipleship when we keep seeing headlines about the debate about wearing masks in public as a public health issue? I think this is why verses 28 through 30 are so moving and meaningful to us still today. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yes, sign me up, please, Jesus. Jesus' assurance of a relationship with him and through him a relationship with God is packed into this invitation. The rules, the regulations, the tests, the dogmas, the walls we build between ourselves and God, these are the burdens we will lose when we open ourselves to letting Christ into our lives. When Christ is at the heart of our words and actions, we live a life with God. <clears throat> Jesus tells us we'll lose our burdens by inviting us to put on his yoke. And this appears counterintuitive. I'm a city girl born and raised in Anaheim, not a farm in sight, but I've seen pictures of yokes. They are hard and wooden, inflexible, and look quite burdensome, actually. How can this be better? But here's the thing, every picture of a yoke I have ever seen has space in it for two creatures. When we are yoked, we are not alone. We're joined, we're connected, and we are connecting. As we are yoked with Jesus, learning Jesus' ways, living Jesus' way, seeing others the way Jesus prays for us to see others, as God's beloved creation, through humbled and loving hearts, we are changed. The way we live is changed. We are connected and we are stronger together. But we are connected and stronger together for a purpose. A farmer does not put a yoke on his cattle so they can go out into the meadow and graze and relax. Putting on the yoke means there's work to be done. And Jesus is inviting us into a whole new way of understanding, of living and experiencing this work. Now in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, the great theologian Thomas Long writes, what Jesus offers is not a hammock, but a yoke. In Judaism, the yoke was a symbol of obedience to the law and wisdom of God. Likewise, Jesus' yoke is obedience to the commandments of the kingdom of heaven, a willingness to serve others with humility and mercy. It is the way of God and is profoundly satisfying to the human soul. To come to Jesus is to be taught gentleness and humility. It is to join with Jesus himself in serving the world in the name of God. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How can a yoke be easy? The Greek word that is used in this text and translated as easy is krestos. And that word is better translated as useful, good, <clears throat> pleasant, and kind. 
So switch out easy with any one of these words. My yoke is good. My yoke is kind. My yoke is pleasant. My yoke is useful. If we're living a Christ-like life, shaped by the cross, which brings new life and new hope to us, a life joined with Christ, easy is not the first word I would choose to describe it. Sharing a yoke with our neighbors in need in a time of necessary six feet distance and mask wearing is not easy but it is good. Sharing a yoke with people with whom we disagree with on public health practices and policies is not easy, but it is kind. Sharing a yoke with anyone when we are emotionally and physically exhausted from the relentless, dire news cycle is not easy, but it is useful. When we accept the yoke Jesus offers, we are joining together with everyone on the other side of it. And with Jesus, you see, it's never an either or proposition. It is a both and way of being, meaning we will join both with Jesus and the other in the work of the kingdom of God. When I, read, <clears throat> when I read the invitation in these verses, what Jesus is inviting us to be and how to live, the only words I can find to say are, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful invitation to learn the unforced rhythms of grace as Eugene Peterson translate this, translates this verse in the message learn the unforced rhythms of grace. As a community of faith, we are continually striving to hear the invitation and put on this yoke or adjust it just a little bit to make ourselves more useful and good. <clears throat> Come to me, all you that are weary and heavy, carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen to Jesus. Find rest. Find peace. Listen and be Christos, useful, kind, and good to yourself and to others. Amen. ourselves to understanding how God is calling us to be in this world, we consider how we are joined, how we are yoked with Christ in the work of building the kingdom of God, the kingdom, beloved community. God has greatly blessed us with many kinds of wealth, many gifts. Let our joy and gladness overflow as we express gratitude to God with the many ways we give our offerings. If anyone would like to join me today and
care for creation in our mayor's I Clean Moline program at two o'clock. We're meeting on the west end of Culver's and we'll be working on 38th Avenue. And the mayor provides all the bags and gloves and we will be socially distanced. It's just one way we share our gifts. As we support the ministries of this church and work in our community, let us consider those whose lives are grievously burdened, reaching out to them in practical acts of mercy. We thank you for your gifts, of your tithes, your offerings, and your continued prayers and support, the ministries and the mission of Hope United Church of Christ. Please join me in prayer as I give thanks and dedicate the gifts this congregation, this community of faith, continue to offer. With all the gifts of creation, you have blessed us, gracious God. We give thanks for all your works. Gratitude is our first impulse for giving. Accept our grateful hearts along with our gifts. And we ask for wisdom as our church com com determines priorities for the use of all of our resources and stewardship of your gifts. May we be as concerned about outreach and mission as we are about programs and things for ourselves. As you are faithful to us, O oh God, may we be faithful in all things, seeking always to live by your gracious will. Amen. And now we join together in blessing and sharing the sacrament of Holy Communion. So I hope you have your bread and your cup, whatever elements symbolize the bread and the cup for you. May God be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy God, we praise and bless you for creation and for your abiding love, which brings us close to you, the source of all blessing. We thank you for creating us in your own image, for forgiving us when we act as though you have no claim on us, and for keeping us in your steadfast care. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, who shared the joys and sorrows of life as we know it. And we remember Christ's death, and we celebrate Christ's resurrection, and as your church, we anticipate Christ's return. We take courage from your Holy Spirit, and we offer you our praise for our sisters, our brothers, and siblings of faith in every age who stand as witnesses to your love and justice. Together, with one voice and with all the company of heaven, we glorify you as we say, Holy, holy, holy God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. And we remember on that night of feasting and then betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, and broke the bread, and then gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Following the meal, he took the cup and said, as he lifted it, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we proclaim Christ's death, celebrate Christ's resurrection, and await Christ's return to us. Let us pray. Gracious God, by your Holy Spirit, bless these gifts of bread and cup, each unique in their composition, each unique in their location, as we are gathered virtually this morning. Bless us, anoint these gifts, and bless us as we receive the bread and the cup that we will offer you our faith and praise 
and that we will be united with Christ and with one another. Through this table of fellowship, make us the body of Christ and may your spirit strengthen us when we feel weak, warm us when we are cold-hearted, bend us when we are stubborn, and move us when we are uncaring. Guide us always in the way of your love. May we continue to be faithful in all things, and as we eat and drink, may the elements be symbols that remind us of who we are and whose we are. We ask all this in the name of the one who extends the invitation to us, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Through this broken bread, we each participate in the new life Christ brings. And through this cup of blessing, we participate and we are invited into covenant with God and one another. This is an open table. This is a table not of the church, but of Jesus Christ. It is made ready for those who love him and those who want to love him more. All are welcome. Come to this table because it is Jesus the Christ who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. Please join in this feast in the spirit of joy and gratitude. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come for all things are ready. Take and eat bread of life. Take and drink this cup of blessing. And now please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
our worship together this morning. Please join me in our benediction, our good word to take us out into the world, masked, distanced, and yet carrying God's love and spirit with us. Carry with you innermost carry with you your innermost selves delight in god's law meditate day by day on god's purpose for your lives we rejoice that god dwells with us every day we want to know and do god's will for us we encounter god in unexpected places god surprises us in the life and witness of people we learn from the youngest in our midst Simple and humble persons have much to teach us. Take Christ's yoke upon you, for that yoke is easy. It imparts confidence that lightens our burdens. We will find rest and renewal through Christ. We seek to express the same humility and greatness. Go, friends, in peace, beloved of God, to love others, to do, to live, to be yoked on this journey together and with the one who strengthens and empowers us. Through God our Creator, Jesus Christ our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit who empowers us and keeps pushing us forward. Go in peace to love and serve our God. Amen. See you at Coffee Hour.